Shalom to Rabbi Marvin Heyer, founder and president of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Shalom. So, you know, throughout the years, we've heard the name so many times about the center. But first of all, remind us why you founded this center and what we are doing today. Well, why I founded the center, it's actually a little interesting story. I took my children to the top pits. I came here to Los Angeles to build a yeshiva, which I did. Eula is the yeshiva I built here in Los Angeles. And when I came, we went to the top pits and uh, took my kids. They were small. And there was a girl, 12 years old. She asked the guide uh, because the top pits, it shows you the footprints of dinosaurs. In the sand, they have actu the actual dinosaurs from tens of thousands of years. They left their footprint in the top pits here in Los Angeles, a very popular place. And people always go there. So the girl asked the guide, if the dinosaurs can come back. And the guide said they can't come back because of climate has changed. Mm -hmm. And they won't survive the climate they have there. So I went home. We had a building, a big building for the yeshiva. And I said, I wonder if we would give the same answer if the question was, can Hitler come again? Would we say because of attitude change in the world, it can't happen again. I said, no, we wouldn't say that. We would say it can happen again. But many would say it can't. And many would say, but we, we would say that it, it's possible to come. We wouldn't give the same answer, that it's automatically guaranteed that a Hitler cannot arise on the world again. So then I said, so why is it? I was thinking to myself, here we have a big building. And in America, 1977 it was, there was not a single address to memorialize the Shoah in the greatest country in the world. As if we are saying, we're sure it can't happen again. And anti-Semitism can't be back in vogue. Nothing official, no museum. There was nothing. no official. Uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Council started in 1979. Mm. This was 1977. So now I had the idea, when I was in Vancouver, I was a rabbi, and I had visited Simon Wiesenthal. I immediately have the idea, why don't we start in our building, the yeshiva building, a whole section of the building devoted to make a museum on the Shoah. But not only on the Shoah, to talk about anti-Semitism today. Survived Hitler. And from there was born the idea and uh, in the beginning, survivors, they didn't, uh, they was, many of them said, why do you have to bring it up? But there were other people who were, and then survivors came on board. So you mentioned that there was no museum on the shore. The United States, the greatest the country in the world. And now we're in different days. So how do you define the, the challenge, the, the mission? has changed throughout the, the years, the, right? the mission is always, even in 19, even in the 78, 79, anti-Semitism became our main. Yes, we were searching, we have Efi Zurov, who's with us, even in 77, 78, 79, still searching for Nazi war criminals, but Nazi. the main focus was anti-Semitism. Because anti-Semitism created if there would be no such concept on the world anti-Semitism, there wouldn't have been a man by the name of Adolf Hitler. He became, we have his only letter, the only letter written by Hitler that links him to the crime is owned by the son Wiesnussen. Of all the archives, he, in, he wrote this letter in 1919, before he ever knew any of the other Nazis. He wrote that the final objective must be the total removal of the Jews altogether. And he signed it. The question is, Rabbi, Esav Sonel Yaakov, they will always hate us, so to speak. So are we supposed to fight anti-Semitism? Are we supposed to be prepared to fight the battles, the terrible battle when it came to the Holocaust, what we're dealing with these days? Can you eliminate anti-Semitism from the core? Well, no, you can't ace of Sonali Yaakov, and we know that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, there are two things that we should do. Number one, we should not live in a world of illusion. Evil exists. It's existed against the Jews for 3,500 years. It's a pretty safe bet they'll still be against the Jews the next 3,500 years. 
But from our history, we should learn that we need friends. America would be, I mean, the Jewish people would be less secure if we wouldn't have a friend like America. It's good to have a friend like America. It doesn't hurt. So we should make it our business to win over friends amongst non-Jews. Because the truth is, the fanatics that are here, they want to do away with Israel. They, if they could, threaten. They would want to do away with America just like they want to do away with Israel. Because America believes in freedom, freedom of expression, and they don't. Mm -hmm. America believes in that if you want to be a teacher, you can be a teacher. If you want to say something against somebody, you have the right to say it. Fanatics don't believe that. Hitler's followers didn't believe that you can criticize the Nazis. Hamas doesn't believe that you can criticize Hamas, their charter. Hezbollah doesn't believe you can criticize Hezbollah. So the smart thing for Jews to do now, after we learned from the Shoah, is to win friends in the non-Jewish community. And there are many non-friends to win. Look at the evangelical Christians in America. 70 million evangelical Christians. They like Israel. They're friends of Israel. Mm -hmm. we would. If we didn't have the 70 million American Christians on Israel's side, I don't know if in Washington many of the things would be accomplished. So we, we have to learn from the Shoah, don't be alone. Have friends. We have a couple of friends. First of all, we have Bilam said, Matovu Alecha. The most important sedra in the Torah, Aserah Sadibra, we named for a non-Jew, Yisro. And by the way, I have a wonderful thing about Yisro. What bothered me about Yisro, and I have my own answer, is that it says, by uh, Yisro, the Torah says very clearly that, uh, that, that the Jewish people came out of Mitzrayim, mm -hmm. and Vayishma Yisro. So Rashi says, What did he hear? What did he hear? He heard Mechia Samolek, and it is Mitzrayim that they went out. So about 10 psukim later, it says that Moshe took Yisro into the tent, into his tent, and he explained to him everything that happened in Mitzrayim. What do I have to do that? It already says, Vayishma Yisro. You're wasting the man's time. You know what the answer is? Mm -hmm. The answer is that Moshe Rabbeinu was afraid he might hear it from the New York Times or the Guardian. Fake news. <laughs> and so he said to himself, I know you heard about it, but I'm afraid from who you heard it. Yeah. Therefore, you better come into the tent, and since I was there, I'll tell you exactly what happened. You mentioned uh, the Friends of Israel, and uh, earlier this week we spoke with um, Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, president of the Conference of European Rabbis, and what he's saying, and many are saying, Israelis, beware. Don't go and be friends with those who are supposedly pro-Israel, or not even supposedly really pro-Israel, while on the other side, they are anti-Semitic, and the core anti-Semitic. How do you deal with that? No, if they're anti-Semites... Yeah, of course, not, if they're pure anti-Semites. Well, of course. Right? But look, the truth of the matter is, you judge them by who they are and, what, and how they act. Listen... I, here in Los Angeles, there are so many non-Jews that are great supporters of Israel. The best. Mm -hmm. Why would we not, uh, you know. Now look, if I find out that somebody is like this, he's a friend of Israel, but his real intention to, is to convert me, I won't be his friend long. Let's take an example. But in of, most of, instances, of I... The Austrian, the Austrian right, okay? Right. So, no, so many that's in different. That. The Austrian right, the problem is, what are they saying on the right? You know what I mean? If they cross over and they, they, they're reincarnating a new form of Nazism, uh, you know, mm -hmm. worshipping Nazi heroes and statues and stuff like that, we have to protest very vigorously. Mm -hmm. But there are many non-Jews. There's in India, there's in China. There's a new world out there. And we would be ridiculous. You know, I reread uh, Jabotinsky's speech in Warsaw in 1938. He warned them. He said, look, I tell you what's happening. You guys don't want to wake up. So when we wake up, there we had no friends. Mm -hmm. in, 19, in 1940 at the Avion Conference, nobody wanted to take in Jews. 
not one country. So we lacked friends. We have to make sure that there's no more avian conferences. There are no more United Nations votes where everybody votes against Israel. We don't want that. So in order to do that, you have to cultivate. And there are many people who know the truth. Look what the Jews have contributed to civilization despite their persecution and suffering. Anybody did better in science, in Nobel laureates. Afal Pikain, even though we had all this sorrows, when a person takes a pill, you got to see whose pill it is. Take an x-ray. Whose x-ray is it? And therefore, it pays for us to make friends, not allow ourselves to be isolated the way we were during the time of Hitler, where we had no friends. That's the smartest route for Israel. I think that the Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing the right thing. Reach out. There's a split in the Arab world. Not all the Arabs are on the same page. Mm -hmm. And if you can win them over and bring them away from the Mishagoyim in Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah, it's a mitzvah to do that. Let's talk about what's happening here in the United States. Right. Is there a rise in anti-Semitism? Of course. Sometimes it seems that it's right versus left if you're allowed to talk about that at all. No, but there is a rise in anti-Semitism. First of all, the anti-Semitism, a lot of the anti-Semitism is caused by the success of Israel. You know, Jews are supposed to be, shh, never, we didn't never. invent anything. When they see the Jews, that, you know, yeah, Israel's going to send now, they're going to send something to the moon. Wow. And stuff like that. They don't want us to be up front. You know that one of the things that the most amazing thing about anti-Semitism is it's, you see how wrong Hitler was in his last will that he signed before he committed suicide. He wrote a one sentence that is often forgotten and ignored. He wrote that he's certain that in a few centuries, anti-Semitism, the hatred of the Jew, meaning Nazism, will return. A few centuries. A few centuries means from 1945, it would mean 2145. But anti-Semitism didn't wait. He was wrong. It didn't take two centuries just took a short amount of time. Why? Because a country started waving a Jewish flag again by the name of Israel. So the anti-Semite said, we can't let that happen. So, but Hitler himself didn't think he would come back that fast. But how do you relate to the political uh, attributes that people are putting in, in terms of anti-Semitism in America, blaming the Trump administration, right. saying that well, it's listen, in the wake of the, listen, the dialogue? Listen. Look, no president gets it right all the time, because that would be a perfect specimen. There are no perfect human beings. No president was ever perfect. Not Harry Truman, not Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan went to Bitburg. Harry Truman had other troubles that, you know, he recognized Israel, but, uh, you know, his wife's mother didn't let Jews in the house. But the fact of the matter is, there's no perfection. But we have to be very thankful that Trump, six presidents, promised that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, they didn't do anything. Trump delivered it. It didn't surprise you. No, he delivered it. But doesn't mean that Trump is perfect, that he opens his mouth every time and we, there's people who say, oh, everything he says is correct. That is not right. That nobody, we don't say that by the biggest gadol. Look what happens in Torah. You ever say that this Rosh Hashiva always, his Shia is always right. There, there's a machlokas. This one says like this. Rashi said, machlokas all. So they're not perfect specimens. They make mistakes. Obama made a tragic mistake giving Shalom Aleichem and giving legitimacy to the biggest anti-Semite in the world, the Ayatollah. That denies the Shoah. George Bush, they all, every one of them made mistakes. They didn't, you know, Ronald Reagan went to Bitburg. He was a good president, and he liked the Jews, but he went to Bitburg. Where is your brain? Why do you stand in the cemetery with the SS? But he went there. So we can't expect perfect specimens, but we can't be ideologues. An ideologue will say like this, I'm a leftist, so the left is always right. I'm a rightist, so the right is always right. They're not always right. We won't make mistakes. The most important thing is to judge a person by what he does. So I'm a Jew. I look at the fact that Trump recognized Yerushalayim, the capital of Israel. We, nobody could take that back. Very hard to take that back. That's a great accomplishment. That's a big schuss for, him, for a person to, to say. Now, 
In the other, on the other hand, Harry Truman, I give him the greatest respect because he recognized the state of Israel when his own Secretary of State, Marshall, told him, if you do it, I quit, and you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And he said, go ahead and quit if you want to. I'm recognizing Israel. You know, so that's my point, that's my point of view. Do you find yourself communicating with uh, the Trump administration, with the family well, about these issues? Yeah, but about what listen, are your messages that well, you? It dep depends on what the issue. I support him on Israel. I do not support. In other words, let's say in Charlottesville, he should have spoken out immediately. Should never have said that both sides are to, are to blame equally. Mm -hmm. The others are KKK and not, and neo Nazis. Yes, I don't like the extreme left neither, but I'm not going to say that they're Nazis and that they're KKK. They're not the same. So why why did that happen? Because people, or no, man, no, listen, listen, everybody, listen. <laughs> I don't I don't believe our Torah says that that even though Lakombi Israel Kamosha owed, it doesn't say that Moshe Rabbeinu was an angel that he didn't make any mistakes, and Aaron Cohen didn't make any mistakes. If they made mistakes, everybody else does. Prime ministers, foreign ministers, presidents, rabbis, priests, everybody makes mistakes. So we can't look at it, oh, this is a perfect specimen. There are no perfect specimens. But we're in a good state. We're in a good, yes. I'm happy to see that somebody, fight, you know, supports Israel, and I, I back that. And I also say <clears throat> that <clears throat> the biggest mistake right-wing people in Israel make is they quote themselves. They should not quote themselves. Whenever people say they should withdraw from the West Bank, and go back to the 67 borders, they shouldn't quote anybody on the right. They should quote Abba Ibn. That Abba Ibn said, a return to the 67 borders is a return to the Auschwitz borders. There's no better quote than that. What, what are you, what's the use of quoting Yitzchak Shamir and Menachem Begin? Quote Abba Ibn. Abba Ibn knew what it is. You know, he, Abba Ibn was on the left. Mm -hmm. He said, if you withdraw to the June 67 borders, those are the Auschwitz borders for the Jewish people. There's no better quote than that. One of the big projects you're working on now is the museum in Jerusalem. I understand that you're not really talking about it no, yet. What can you tell we, us? We didn't know, but I can tell you that, it, look, look at our museum here. Seven million visitors, 95% of them non-Jews. You should see what they write when they visit teenagers from various religions. Our objective in Jerusalem is to win friends for the state of Israel, for the Jewish people. It'll be a very Jewish museum, but a very humanitarian. Welcome to the Chinese, to the Indians, to people from Europe. We, our museum would be a failure in Jerusalem if the only visitors were Jews. You know, some people feel that uh, when you take a person that comes to, to visit Israel, it might be a mistake on the big picture, when you show him the Shoah, the Holocaust, you say, because of that, we need Israel. We know there was a quote about from Obama, because of the Holocaust, no, we're Israel. Not, we don't have the, sh the Shoah. Well, our, our museum in Jerusalem is not about the Shoah. So exactly. It's our museum is about the core values of the Jewish people that kept them alive. That's the first section. Is the core values that kept the Jewish people alive, even though they had no land, they were in exile, they had no army and they had no flag. They were loyal to those core values. Community, standing up to evil, scholarship, learning Torah, faith that there is a God in the world. These are all separate pavilions. The second section of the museum is the world today. It's good parts and it's duplicity. One nation is criticized in the United Nations over and over. The state of Israel. No criticism on anybody else in the world. All the other things are overlooked. Mm -hmm. that, and when people see that, and they come there, we, we want a lot of non-Jews to come. The more non-Jews to come into our museum, the better we are. You think it could be even part of the official visit of dignitaries? Oh, I have no doubt. Take a look. Every world leader, the, most, the two words most out of their mouths is tolerance and human dignity. So how could they go to Jerusalem and not visit the Museum of Tolerance in the eternal capital of the Jewish people and a city held sacred by all the religions of the world? Rabbi Marvin Heyer, thank you very much for joining us. What is your message to, to our viewers, to the people at well, the end of this interview? I would say that I firmly believe that many nations in the world will copy the United States and move their embassies to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Yerushalayim. Amen.